is Dr. Demento, live in the Big Lounge on 101.9. Yeah, here we are live in the Bing Lounge. It is, uh, well, now the drive at 5, but a special drive at 5 because we've got Dr. Demento who has to make a quick run over to Reed College tonight. But uh, we have been having fun finding out so much about the man. One of my other questions is because uh, I've got a blues show that I've been doing in this town for the last 18 years. It starts in about an hour from now. How did you get hooked into the blues? Well, my, uh, my dad and mom had a lot of records, mostly classical, but a little folk music, too. And one of them, which I heard from the time I was about seven, was an album by Lead Belly, a, a book of 78s. It included Good Morning Blues and John Henry. Uh, so, so that first planted the seed. Uh, then I was probably, I was about 12 when I saw a 10-inch LP in a store, and it said, The Man Who Taught Josh White and Lead Belly, and that turned out to be an album of Blind Leonard Jefferson. So I heard that. Uh, then I was taking I, I was taking dancing lessons in eighth grade, and uh, among along with the big band stuff, uh, the man put on uh, Joe Turner's record of Shake Rattle and Roll. He thought that would be a good record for us to do the Lindy to, <laughs> so the Lindy Hop. So and then the next thing I discovered this store that sold records that had been taken off jukeboxes, 19 cents a piece. I could afford some of those on my allowance. And uh, at first I just bought the normal hits of the day, the Perry Como and the Patty Page and so on. But then I saw this chess record with a picture of two chess figures on it. What the heck is that? Uh, it didn't look like it was instructions in how to play chess. And the artist on the record was Muddy Waters. What the heck is that going to sound like? I brought it home. Uh, it was Standing Around Crying by Muddy Waters, one with Little Walter, one of his more intense pieces. And uh, so that... I, I didn't maybe get hooked on that right away, but then when I discovered a station in Little Rock, Arkansas that I could pick up in Minneapolis that played more of that music, I could hear uh, Muddy had his hit Manish Boy at that time, and I, I could hear that and lots more. And so I discovered there was one store in downtown Minneapolis that sold those records. They boasted that they brought them all right up from Chicago. So I started spending my lunch money on those, uh, buying 45s new at the time by Buddy Waters, Little Walter, Jimmy Reed as they came out. So that was kind of how I got hooked on blues. And I realized right away, this was the, the 19, late 1950s, and I realized right away that it was as exciting as rock and roll, but deeper. Right. So that, that's what got me into blues. And well, then later on, I, of course, was able to learn more about it. In those days, I could not just walk into a bookstore and buy a nice book about blues or right. dozens of them as there are now. In those days, uh, in 1959, the first decent book about older blues came out, The Country Blues by Sam Charters. Uh, outdated maybe, but at, at that time, it was certainly the best book about blues that had ever come out. And and before that, there was really nothing about blues that you could read. You, you could read just maybe a scrap here and there about Robert Johnson or Blind Lemon, people like that. But uh, in fact, it was that way about all early music. There was just very little that you could read about it, even in the library. But now we're so lucky that we have this wealth of information. Yeah. And now, if you're a blues fan, like Steve and me, there is more blues available now than at any time in the past, if you count you, you, uh, uh, iTunes and other sources and YouTube and whatever. There is a lot more available than there was in 1957 or yeah. 37 any uh in 1957 you could buy a few of the recent releases maybe half a dozen lp reissues and that was it yeah why do you think that is you think now with our everybody that has a cd burner is their own record label now exactly yeah no, that's a good way to put it yeah. but also more and more people have just got through your work yeah. maybe through some of mine have gotten gotten the message that this is wonderful stuff right and getting the music to the people without sometimes the middlemen is uh, the best way to work it, too. Yes. Do right. you find yourself going to blues festivals? Are you a music guy that goes out and enjoys a, a good live show every once in a while? I did for a while. I've maybe backed off a little, but I, yeah. we had two blues festivals going uh, in Los Angeles for a while, and uh, and I went to those pretty regularly. Right. So. Well, we, uh, we help sponsor the one here, the Portland Waterfront Blues mm -hmm. Festival, and you, oh, my cool. friend, if you ever want VIP... You come on out, all right? Thank you. Yeah, we sure would love will. to have you. Got a deal. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so how about uh, you tell us a little bit about uh, the man that you turned me on to, Shell, the uh, 
That, that, he's just okay. about everything. He's a yeah. cartoonist. Yeah, he's yeah, everything. True, true Renaissance man. Yeah. A lot of people first got to know him for his cartoons in Playboy magazine. And uh, he, he was... He, <laughs> That's true. He was a great friend of uh, Hugh Hefner's, right. and so he would do cartoons for the magazine quite regularly. Uh, he once published a poem in that magazine, which was called The Smoke Off, all about a, a smoking battle in Yankee Stadium, and, and that he wound up recording that too. And uh, he began recording actually in 1957 uh, and made quite a number, of pro- probably eight or nine complete albums that he made during the course of his career. Uh, Some of them more song-oriented, some of them more poem-oriented, shall we say. Uh, But he he became even more famous a little later for his two albums of kids' songs, both of which were based, of course, on children's books. Same guy who first became famous with these cartoons for Playboy, (laughs) here he was with these really wonderful and magical books for children. Uh, There were actually three or four of them, Where the Sidewalk Ends, The Giving Tree, and... uh, a light in the attic. attic. Yes, yeah. right. And uh, these are still these books are still in print today and still very popular. And I I certainly could recommend them for anybody with a slightly brighter than average child. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's one uh, way to look at yeah, it. and and it, it it'll help inspire that kid. All right. You want some shell? Yeah. Is my is one of my favorites. So this I asked actually, him if he play. though he wrote it a little earlier in his career. This was recycled in in where the sidewalk ends. Shell Silverstein. Oh, Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. She'd wash the dishes and scrub the pans, cook the yams and spice the hams, and though her parents would scream and shout, she simply would not take the garbage out. And so it piled up to the ceilings, coffee grounds, potato peelings, brown bananas and rotten peas, chunks of sour cottage cheese. It filled the can, it covered the floor, it cracked the windows and blocked the door with bacon rinds and chicken bones, drippy ends of ice cream cones, prune pits, peach pits, orange peel, gloppy glumps of cold oatmeal, pizza crust and withered greens, soggy beans and tangerines, crusts of blackburn butter toast, grisly bits of beefy roast. The garbage rolled on down the hall. It raised the roof. It broke the walls, I mean greasy napkins, cookie crumbs, blobs of gooey bubble gum, cellophane from old bologna, rubbery blubbery macaroni, peanut butter cake and dry curdled milk and crust of pie, rotting melons, dried up mustard, eggshells mixed with lemon custard, cold french fries and rancid meat, yellow lumps of cream of wheat. <sighs> At last, the garbage reached so high that finally it touched the sky and none of her friends would come to play and all the neighbors moved away and finally Sarah Cynthia Stout said, okay, I'll take the garbage out. But then, of course, it was too late. The garbage reached across the state from New York to the Golden Gate. And there in the garbage she did hate. Poor Sarah met an awful fate that I cannot right now relate because the hour is much too late. But children remember Sarah Stout and always take the Garbage out. Shell Silverstein. And we didn't even mention all the hits he wrote for other artists, like A Boy Named Sue, and uh, the cover of The Rolling Stone, and uh, uh, The Unicorn, which the Irish Rover has made into a top ten hit. The very versatile Shell Silverstein, and a, a, a whole truckload of country songs. We're going to shift gears a little bit and, and play some music from here in Portland, some local music. And this, uh, uh, the, the guy who serenaded you uh, with his noisemakers in the national anthem a little bit earlier, Mr. Dan Fiebiger, 
Weaver. He's been making music in his basement studio in deepest North Portland for a number of years now. And uh, he and a collaborator, Mark Friedley, uh, put together this uh, nice little Beach Boys parody. So this is called Hooker Curl. <laughs> Dan Feebigger, ladies and gentlemen, a former percussionist with the Portland Junior Symphony, among others.